Acts chapter 18, and I'm going to begin uh, here with two verses, verses 5 and 6, and I'm going to try to angle my way into my subject matter today. <laughs> Acts chapter 18, verses 5 and 6. And when Silas and Timotheus, that's Timothy, were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they, the Jews, opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. In three specific places in the book of Acts, Acts chapter 13, here in Acts 18, and then later in Acts chapter 28, the Jews are given a chance to believe in God by grace through faith. And they refused it. They refused it because in all three places there were Gentiles present who were eager to hear more about it. Maybe God would save them and give them a chance to repent. But the Jews rejected it because they didn't want to believe in something if it meant the Gentiles could also believe it. They thought they were better than the Gentiles. The Lord had been revealing himself to the world through the nation of Israel. And so Paul tells them in chapter 13, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing ye put it from you, and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. And then Paul tells the Jews in Acts 28, verse 28, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and that they will hear it. We'll go someplace where people are willing to listen. You don't want to hear it? We'll go some talk to people who, who do want to hear it, are willing to listen. But it says in our text, when they opposed themselves, verse 6. You know, some people are their own worst enemies when it comes to success in life or when it comes to even knowing Jesus Christ. Some nuts in the bowl are harder to crack than other nuts are. You have to get those little plier things out, right? Paul says it again in 2 Timothy verses, verse 25. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. Some people want to try and earn their salvation rather than let God save them. They'd rather work harder and not smarter. They want to do things the hard way. They get in their own way when it comes to salvation with God. Salvation is a very easy proposition, but people want to make it difficult. If, if someone says, listen, I'll pick up the tab for you, not, there's nothing. Don't say, well, let me offer the tip too. No, let that person pay all of it. If they're offering, then trust them to worry about the tip. If the waitress gets mad, she gets mad at them for not leaving one, right? Don't say, well, let me do part of it. E either they're offering or they're not offering. That might seem like a bra brash, rude way to deal with someone who's treating you out to dinner. But listen, if God wants to save you, let him save you. And if he's going to do so by you trusting only in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ and trusting in nothing else then by all means, let him do it. Let him do it. But some people get in their own way. And that seems paradoxical. It so, seems self-contradictory. So let's continue with the theme I started a few weeks ago on the paradox of Christ. And then I preached after that the paradox of the Christian. And today I want to call this the paradox of Christian living. The paradox of Christian living. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And we'll start at verse 1. 
It says here, We then, as workers together with him, with Christ, beseech you that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Don't just get saved and then feel secure about it and then don't do anything. Go out and live like an unsaved guy lives. Well, I got mine, and that's all I need. Verse 2, For he saith, he's quoting the prophet Isaiah, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. To succor means to give help, to give comfort to someone. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Giving no offense in anything that the ministry be not blamed. Paul uses an Old Testament prophecy about the eventual regathering and restoration of the nation of Israel and the kingdom, and he applies it to the spiritual salvation of Gentiles. Verse 4, But in all things approving ourselves as the ministers of God, in much patience, in afflictions, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, as being beaten for it, in imprisonments, thrown in jail, in chaos, there's a lot of, rather, in tumults, that's a lot of chaos, a lot of screaming and yelling and near violence breaking out, in labors, in watchings. You no, know, watchings was to sometimes lose sleep because you thought someone might try to sneak up and murder you in the middle of the night. You're watching. Make sure that doesn't happen. In fastings, by pureness of knowledge, excuse me, by pureness, by knowledge, by long suffering, by kindness, by the Holy Ghost, by love unfeigned. It's not fake. By the word of truth, that's scripture, by the power of God, by the armor of righteousness on the right hand and on the left. By honor, some people admire you, and dishonor, some people hate you by evil report and good report. As deceivers, hey, what's your real hidden agenda? And yet true, you don't have one. Point number one today, verse nine. As unknown and yet well known. How can you be both unknown and well known at the same time? That's a paradox, but it's not an impossibility. Not an impossibility. Paul told the Thessalonians, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to Godward is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 8. There were two places Paul said he didn't have to worry about because the Thessalonians had been busy going out and spreading the gospel. But who started doing that? Who was the first Thessalonian to say, hey, I'm going to go out and pass some tracks out to over in Achaia? Who was the first one that did that? We don't know. Only God knows. You'll, you and I will find out someday at the judgment seat of Christ. Whoever that first believer was is going to receive rewards for what he did. And as a, there was a little known Christian man named Edward Kimball. Very few people will remember the name of Edward Kimball, but Edward Kimball led a young man named Billy or uh, D. L. Moody to Jesus Christ, and Dwight L. Moody became one of the greatest evangelists in history. But who remembers Edward Kimball? Very few. So, indirectly, Edward Kimball is well known yet unknown. I knew a man, and uh, so do you. So did you who was relatively unknown all of his adult life. He had a semi-public uh, persona, and yet he stopped giving interviews about 30 years ago. And yet the man was, like I say, was virtually unknown most of his life, and yet he was the most widely circulated Christian author in the history of Christianity for the last 1,000 years. His name was Jack Thomas Chick. Put out a billion tracks over a 60-year period, 
And those things circulate throughout the world in well over 100 languages. He being dead, yet speaketh. So you can be both unknown and well-known at the same time. It's not an impossibility. Secondly, we're dead, yet we live. We're dead, yet we live. Verse 9, as dying, and behold, we live. The less attention you give to the needs or the wants of these bodies, the more alive you are in the service of Jesus Christ. That's a paradox, but it's nevertheless true. So Paul bemoans this predicament. But I see another law in my members, that is this body, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? Romans 7, verses 23 and 24. A Christian wants to do right, but... He's always hit, uh, confronted with temptation to do wrong. It's a daily struggle. It's a daily fight you have to fight. You cannot depend today on whatever spiritual victory you enjoyed yesterday. Every day is a new fight. Every day is a new challenge to walk right and be upright and live according to the holiness and the holy uh, reputation of God and Jesus Christ. If, Jesus, if you can't imagine Jesus Christ doing a thing then uh, why would you want to do it? Why would you say, well, yeah. I don't have to be held to the same standards that uh, the Lord Jesus Christ lived up to or that the best Christians I ever heard of lived up to. I don't have to be held to the same standards that the preacher at church uh, the professors or that he puts into practice or the best Christian I know at church lives up to. Why? Why are you exempt? You shouldn't be. <clears throat> and um, so Paul says in one place, I die daily. That's what he said. You know, the old song says, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my hands, let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet, let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice, take my lips, take my silver, take my gold. Not a mite will I withhold. Let God have everything. Let him take everything if it will bring you closer to him. It will bring you closer to him. Give up the interests of this life. Give up the hopes and dreams and aspirations that come from the flesh and say, whatever God wants me to do, that's what I want to do. And help me to be satisfied with it, God. Help me to, to be pleased and happy that I've done what you've allowed me to do. To have some part in the preaching of the gospel and the spreading of the gospel of Jesus Christ. To be a testimony in some way. So you need to die so that you can live. Thirdly, let me say this. Verse 10. As sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. The Word of God says, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. People at work, people at school, they might refuse the gospel track. But rejoice that you had a chance to pass one out. Rejoice that you, know, you weren't thrown in jail at the very sight of a track. That hasn't happened quite yet. All the liberals in this country are working towards that, but it hasn't happened yet. Rejoice because you have the gospel of Jesus Christ and you know it in your heart and you can offer it to somebody in the most simple form available. Thank God for gospel tracts. Right. Be thankful whenever someone does read one. Be thankful for that. People might be rude to you, but rejoice when they're not rude. Rejoice uh, that at least... You got some response. I had a friend in Bible school named Joe Siddharth. He and I graduated from Pensacola Bible Institute together. He and I were out street preaching one afternoon. And uh, we got in the car. We're heading back to the church after a couple of hours on the sidewalk. 
And he said, you know, what we can do is we can speak like some of these evangelists speak and sort of inflate the numbers or the responses and say, we had 75 decisions this afternoon. They were all no, no thank you. But at least they were decisions for Christ. They said, no, don't want it. But, you know, your relatives might be unsaved. Rejoice that you're saved. Rejoice that you're saved. The brethren, your fellow brother, sister, brothers and sisters in Jesus Christ, they might disappoint you greatly. You ought, to be, you ought to rejoice that you have brethren in Jesus Christ. You know, Elijah thought he was all alone right. in Israel. And God had to tell him, listen, I've reserved to myself 7,000 men that you don't even know about that have not bowed the knee to Baal. That was an encouragement to Elijah. It ought to be an encouragement to you. You're not alone. Your children may be lost. They might be living far away from God if they ever were saved. But rejoice that they have, you have children. Not everybody has able to, been able to have them. Not everybody could have them or conceive them. Be thankful that you have them and be thankful if they still have minds to think and reason with. You can still uh, talk to about their soul, about the gospel of Jesus Christ. There may always be some reason to have sorrow, to have disappointment. But it seems like with every sorrow, there's always some reason to rejoice. There's always something. They always say, well, look for uh, the, you know, every cloud has a silver lining. And that's probably true. Even unsaved people have that much sense that don't dwell on the negative, dwell on the positives. You know, when I was uh, diagnosed with, I'll make it personal for a few minutes. When I was diagnosed with uh, esophageal cancer about two years ago, and I'm not out of the woods with it all yet, but I never thought, hey, I'm, I'm going through something so bad, no one else ever went through it. Are you kidding me? Be thankful for the problems you don't have. Be thankful for the difficulties and the struggles you don't have to endure and go through. No matter how bad your predicament is, no matter how bad and, and unjust your life seems to be, there's always somebody whose conditions are worse than yours. You got seven and a half billion people in the world. There's bound to be somebody, maybe dozens of people with far worse problems than you have. So be thankful for the ones you don't have. Look at it that way and you'll receive more of a blessing than you ever thought possible. There's always some reason to be sorrowful, but along with it, there's bound to be some reason to rejoice. Uh, Paul goes even further than, than saying, in everything give thanks. He says, giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, verse 20. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. Philippians 4, verse 4. Now, I want you to go forward to 2 Corinthians 12 and notice there verses 3 and 4. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 3 and 4. Paul writes, And I knew such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I cannot tell, God knoweth, how that he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. So, point number four today. Christians hear unspeakable words. Not unpronounceable words, but unspeakable words. They're too lovely to be uttered. They're too loved to be expressed here on the earth. If Paul says, as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, then um, why shouldn't the speech, why shouldn't the conversation of the saints in heaven be a little bit uh, otherworldly? Not fit to be spoken down here in this world cursed with sin and death and decay. You know, not only is this world filled with un unregenerated men and women, unsaved men and women, not only is it filled with saved and unsaved people whose bodies are corrupt because of the sin that's in them, 
but the earth itself is filled with the dead bodies of people who died in that condition. This world is cursed, and it's got corruption all over it. It was cursed in the book of Genesis because of man's sin, and it hasn't gotten out from under that curse yet. In fact, the actions of man got so bad, he had to drown out everything, start again with Noah and his family. But the earth was, was cursed, and it was judged because of that curse. It's going to be remade one day by the perfection and the power of Jesus Christ. But that time hasn't come yet. And this earth isn't worthy to re receive certain things that are only suited in heaven in the presence of God. Now, conversely, you wouldn't wear a nice wristwatch and a nice pair of shoes if you had to climb into a dumpster to look for something you lost, right? You'd make sure you weren't trampling on, you know, rotten apple, you know, cores and banana peels and coffee grounds and everything else. Uh, and some bum who crawled in there to sleep. You know, you don't want to be stepping over all that when uh, you're looking for something. You don't drive a new Infinity or a Lexus through the ghetto. It's out of place. Some things, you know. Let's say uh, you, you hear the, the music, some of the good music that often is uh, produced here among our church members, our young people, and um, the world might think, that's sure corny. Who wants to hear that? And yet, as a Christian, you suddenly say, you know, I never used to like it, but now there's something about that. I like that. So... By the Holy Spirit, you hear unspeakable words. You know things that are going to happen in the future, even if your next door neighbor, even if other Christians are completely ignorant of them. Point number five. This will be my last point for today, for brevity. And there are a lot of examples we could go to, but we're not going to turn to all of them today. But point number five. You and I are weak, yet strong. We're weak, yet strong. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 10. Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. There's the conditional part. For when I am weak, then am I strong. This is like the earlier paradox of dying and yet being alive. You might think you're weak in the service of Jesus Christ. There's very little you can do. You don't play an instrument. You don't sing very well. You're not good at public speaking. You're, you get intimidated about it. And, um, but uh, you might feel that way, but you can be unbelievably strong in the service of Jesus Christ, whether you realize it or not. The most influential Christians are the ones who pray. Prayer changes things, it's often been said. That old expression I learned when I was a little kid, the devil trembles when he sees the weakest saint upon his knees. Right? God answers email. If you can do nothing else, you can pray. Pray for every need you have. Pray for every need your brothers in Christ or sisters in Christ have. Pray for everything that is not fully clear to your own mind, but you know it needs God's help. Nothing is uh, so bad that it can't be made better if God gets involved with it. But the most influential Christians are the ones who know how to pray. Get a hold of God. I had a little grandmother... My grandmother, Leonard, and, uh, excuse me, she was a simple country girl. I don't know if she, I don't know how much education she ever got. Six, seven, six, seventh grade, maybe. Never drove a car. My grandfather drove her everywhere she needed to go. Grocery store, beauty salon, and places of that kind. But 
she was a real prayer warrior. I was walking through a restaurant. We were in Pensacola one Sunday afternoon, and I'll never forget this. It's the most grotesque sight I've seen in years. And I work for a funeral home, and I've seen a lot of grotesque sights. And this, this was... We're walking through a restaurant. Everyone's got, you know, one of those all-you-can-eat buffets. It was on a Sunday afternoon, so there's a lot of church people that got out of church, and they're in there having their afternoon lunch. And kids were real small, and we're walking from our... I was walking from our, the, the buffet line to our table. And I walked past this lady. She got this T-shirt on that didn't fit very well. Cigarette hanging out of her mouth and her, her tray and her, and her uh, uh, T-shirt read, Prayer Warrior. Yeah, <laughs> I went, uh, Dr. Ruckman used to say, I wouldn't trust her to lead us in silent prayer. <laughs> but I had a grandma who was a real prayer warrior. She didn't get out of the house much because she didn't drive a car, and she was one of those kind of little nervous Nellies, and, and you'd never, it wasn't her nature to get in conversation with people, but she could pray. And she believed what her preacher told her from the Word of God. And she only had one Bible. Thank God for that. And my grandfather the same way. But she prayed for us grandkids. She prayed for my mom and my dad. She prayed for all of her relatives. And uh, every time it was a, someone's birthday, we'd get a birthday card from her. So I knew we were on her mind. She'd pray for us and pray for what God might want to do with our lives. And I'm very thankful to God that I had a sweet little Christian grandma like that. But the most successful soul winners also never went to seminary. They never went to Bible college. The most successful soul winners go down to the gas station. They go to the supermarket. They go to the bus stations. They go to train stations. They go to the coffee shops. They go to county fairs. They go anywhere they can go uh, in hopes of being a testimony for Christ. Maybe pass out some tracts. Or... Listen, if there's nobody there, leave the track on a bench anonymously and then Pray that God blesses it, and whoever is intended to get that will pick it up and read it, and it will do in them what God wants to do with it. If that's all you can do, don't think I'm an, I'm an unsuccessful, I'm an ineffective soul winner because I never get much experience at talking to people. Listen, if you dropped one track every day, seven days a week, you pass out 365 tracks in a year. Be like that Christian who was the first one to witness in Macedonia, who knows his name? I don't know. Maybe it was one of the Christian sisters who first said, I got a relative who lives in Macedonia or in Achaia. I want to contact them about the Lord Jesus too. You don't know. Only, only time will tell, only the judgment seat of Christ will reveal the hidden things and the saints who were unknown to us and yet well known to God. I don't need the accolades of men as much as I want the approval of Jesus Christ. But the most successful soul winners are those who will go anywhere if it gives them a chance to talk about the Lord or to plant a seed. The Apostle Paul says, 1 Corinthians 3, that one planteth, another watereth. He says, but God giveth the increase. So don't measure your success as a soul winner by how many people cross the finish line and say, I want to pray that prayer with you. Once in a while, that one will happen to you. But it's the result of Christians before you who planted the first seed in that person's heart, who spoke a kind word or gave a testimony to that person about their own salvation, who told them how simple it is to be saved, who told them what a joy they, they have in life because they know Jesus Christ and how easy that person could, find and could, could come to know Him as well. All of those things working together lead that person to, the say, to say, I'm ready, I want to receive Jesus Christ. And you have to be patient. Listen, God, that's what's called long-suffering. If God has been long-suffering with you, He puts up with a lot from you, then you certainly can be long-suffering in the service of Jesus Christ. I want you to turn back to the book of Ezekiel. Before we close, to Ezekiel chapter 3. Ezekiel 3.
Ezekiel 3, and let's read verses 17 through 19. Ezekiel 3, verses 17 through 19. Here God speaks, and he says, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth, and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, Thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way, to, say, uh, <clears throat> to save him, excuse me, to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood will I require at thy hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked, and he turn not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked ways, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. So Paul says in our text and to his audience, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. He said, we'll go to some people that want to hear it. We've wasted enough time. We spent enough time giving you a chance to receive it. And uh, he said to them in one place, since ye put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. We've done all we can. And uh, now it's in your court. Now it's in your ballpark. You, uh, have a, you might be one of those Christians with bumper stickers on the back of your car. I used to have some magnetic stickers. I don't have any at the moment because we got a new car and there's not enough space on the bumper for a nice sticker to fit there. That's at least that's the excuse I use for not having one. I mean, anyway, I'm just kidding. And actually that's part, that's partly true. But, um, if you're a Christian who has a nice bumper sticker with a gospel on the back of your bumper, do me this much favor, at least keep your car clean, right? Someone pulls up behind you at a stop sign or stoplight. They're there for 15 seconds till the light changes. They're reading that sticker in the back of your car. That might be the only exposure they have to you or you to them ever. But once that light changes and you both drive away, now they are responsible for what they just read. They have to do something with that knowledge, with that information. They pass out a track, it's the same thing. Now the person, if they're willing to read it, they are accountable to God. They're responsible for what they read. You've delivered your soul. So don't discount uh, soul winning uh, if all you're able to do today is to pass out tracks or leave a track for somebody. You say, listen, find some creative ways to do it. Enjoy doing it. Walk out of the, and I had this idea came to me when I, I put it into practice one time, and I think it was very successful. We ate someplace, we walked out of the restaurant without leaving a tip. And then I walked back in with a good tip for the waitress. I said, listen, I didn't want to forget about this. And by the way, here's something about Jesus Christ. I, I care about people and I'd like you to read it. Give us some thought later on when you get off your shift. And leave it at that. Don't press her to, hey, can you make a decision right now? Bow your head and pray with me over that coffee. No, don't do that. You know, you be as wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. But if you got a good tip, if you leave her a good tip, she's more like, inclined to read the track that's attached to it than she will be just giving her one of those fake tracks that's folded, looks like a $50 bill, and you open it up and says, here's your tip, and it's just a gospel track. Those don't work. Someone thinks that's a funny joke, but it's not funny to the waitress who just served you and got nothing for her efforts. Because we live here in Southern California, and we have, we're a melting pot of this, this part of the world, you could visit the entire Pacific Rim without leaving Los Angeles County. You really could. And since we have so many uh, Mexican people and Spanish-speaking people, uh, you could visit Mexico or South America for that matter, without leaving Southern California. You don't even have to go there to visit. They're coming here, <laughs> which is okay. I mean, that's what God's doing. So I decided what I'd do a few years ago. I went to Chick Publications. I got a bunch of tracks in different languages. And I got one of multiple languages, and I stuck this whole stack in my shirt pocket. And I went to a hospital one time. You go through the, to the uh, security guard there at the front of the hospital, the City of Hope. 
And uh, you know, there's an Asian guy, security guard there, but he looked, his last name is you know, Perez. So I'll, he's Asian looking, but he's Hispanic, so he must be Filipino. So I, I reach in my pocket and I put the Filipino track on the bottom and I said, hey, I, by the way, I got something for you. And I said, no, that's Spanish. No, that one's not for you. Uh, Cambodian, no. Uh, uh, Lithuanian, no. Um, Portuguese, no. Vietnamese. By this time, he's, he's hoping I have one for him. So when I finally get to the Tagalog one in uh, Filipino, he's excited to take it. He's eager to take it. Yeah, trick him. Paul says, I caught you with guile. And um, so look for creative ways to do it. It doesn't have to be a boring exercise. It can be very beneficial, be very helpful. And uh, you and a little bit of tact and a little bit of uh, discretion, discernment, at the same time you're doing it. And uh, God will listen. If you don't pray over the track you give or the track you leave somewhere, then you don't have a great expectation of God blessing it. God might bless it in spite of you. But you ought to pray that this will come to the right person, Lord, make the right person find this and make their heart willing to read it and receive what is offered there, how that they can be born again by trusting Jesus Christ. Now, I only went through several, uh, a few examples, not all of them, but uh, these are what I call the paradox of Christian living.